suck. I am... I'm good. Oh, wait one second, it's not Oh no, you're not gonna be on, right? Nah, I just gotta come in. There we go. Great. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our pre-show coverage of the Sean Spicer press briefing from the White House, which we do. We cover all of his press briefings here at Right Side Broadcasting, and we will today. We'll cover it live. We'll have it for you, full screen. Uh, for now, I am Steve Luckner here at the Right Side Studios. We are going to do our pre-show. And then today, we have a little extra thing at the end of the press briefing. If the scheduling works out right, we're going to have live coverage of President Trump's signing of his new executive order today about energy. And that's up. So, so the schedule is this 1 p.m. Eastern, Sean Spicer press briefing, 2 p.m. Eastern, President Trump signing the executive order on energy. And right now it's 12, 14 Eastern. So assuming that all happens on schedule, the plan is to go right from Sean Spicer's press briefing to President Trump's executive order. However, there could be a little time between them, so you might see me then, or they could overlap a little bit, so we'll have to figure out what to do then. We'll figure it out and let you know. Uh, but the plan also is to come out, come back after that, after the briefing and President Trump signing the executive order and do a little post show for you. Maybe we'll try to take a couple calls today. I think we're gonna try to do that on the post show today. So, uh, so please join us for that and stick around for our coverage of the briefing and the signing of the executive order. So here on the pre-show, if you've seen it before, we love to get your comments and your questions about what's going on in the world today, what, pre what Sean Spicer might be asked about. And uh, there's a number of things. I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit of, I have a bit of dread about what he's gonna be asked about today, because I just, uh, so, <sighs> The news coverage of like the last day is just, to me, it's being taken up with these issues that are like kind of related to this whole Russia investigation thing, which to me personally at this point is kind of like this non-issue that's being blown up into this gigantic thing. I mean, look, if I'll be the first one to say if somebody presents me with like really solid evidence that uh, the Trump administration was trying to help Russia and hurt America, or the Trump administration was leading, was like coordinating with the Russian government to like release leaks about Hillary Clinton or something like that. Well, fine, then I'll say something like, then, I, then I'll be on board with saying, wow, that's a really serious thing. But I've seen no evidence to that effect. And, 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 and I don't think anyone's seen any in public has seen any evidence to that effect. So we just have like this giant conspiracy theory that's going on and on and on. But in the last couple days, it's just like, it's like the only thing anyone's talking about like in the news and in like the media, in like the mainstream media. Like look at the big stories today, like both on like CNN and MSNBC and like, you know, like, like major papers, you know, like the New York Times and the Washington Post. What are the stories? Well, one story, this Devin Nunes thing, to me, when this came out, it's, I saw it as like, okay, it's a story and I could see it ending up being important, but right now it's kind of like this fuzzy technical matter and no one's gonna really care. This is, it's become the biggest deal in the world to everyone, whether Devin Nunes excuses himself from the Russia investigation of the House Intelligence Committee. So just to backtrack a little bit, uh, let me see if I can summarize this briefly. It's just, it's, it's hard to do, but I'll try to summarize it briefly. Uh, I'm so sick of it already. Devin Nunes last week said, hey, I have some information from a source about this intelligence that was collected and distributed widely in the government. And this intelligence uh, involves surveillance that, uh, surveillance reports either surveillance of or just surveillance reports about that have information about uh, President Trump and his associates. 
And it bothers me, Devin Nunes said, that this information, this surveillance information about President Trump and his associates is being uh, widespread, is being spread so widely in the government, and I think that could be a problem. So I went to the White House and I told him this was happening. And then we have this sort of series of uproars in the media about this. First, it was like, oh, he didn't tell the House Intelligence Committee before he went to the White House, and that's this huge deal. And then it was revealed last night that he got the information on a building in the building on the White House grounds and uh, now this is like oh now this is a giant uproar is like oh he went to the White House to get this information so it must be which he didn't he went to the building on the White House grounds so it must be the case that like President Trump leaked him the information although the White House denies that any White House officials gave him this information so there's all this uproar and like now this new uproar is like well he's got to re excuse himself from leading the investigation the, the House intelligence investigation into the Russia, Russia involvement in our election. Now, one thing that's really bothering me about all this endless, endless energy and print and time on air that's been spent on this story is like, it's, it's, it's all about like, it's like, it's like the biggest deal in the world to a lot of people in the media, uh, whether... Devin Nunes excuses himself from the House Intelligence Committee investigation into Russian involvement in the elections. Now, to me, I don't personally think that investigation is going to turn anything up anyway because I have a hard time believing that the Trump campaign was like like betraying America and trying to help Russia or was like secretly plotting with the Russian government to like subvert the whole election process. To me, it seems kind of like a nutty conspiracy theory. Look, if I'm presented with, again, if I'm presented with evidence to the contrary, I'll be the first one to say, okay, you got the evidence now, but I haven't seen anything. It just seems kind of unlikely. Uh, and nothing's turned up so far that's been made public. So, my, my point is, this whole investigation, to, all this effort that's being spent on this investigating this stuff, I think there's a case to be made that like, that's a giant waste of time. But now it's like a giant waste of time on top of a giant waste of time, which is time wasted worrying about and complaining about uh, whether someone will excuse themselves from this investigation where the investigation, I feel like, in itself is going to end up being a giant waste of time and also a giant distraction. I would much rather everyone just talk about more important issues like, okay, what should we do about health care if, if this health care bill isn't going to pass, which is not going to pass and was withdrawn? Is there anything else we can do about it? Um, what should we do about tax reform? Uh, should we, what should we do about an infrastructure bill? And that's so much effort, both by the media and also like a lot of Democrats, too, is being spent on this. It bothers me as an American just because like, I would like to see Democrats come out with work and release some proposals about what you'd like to see with like tax reform and infrastructure and the health care bill, you know. And just, it, it just to me, again, it's, it, to me, it's like a giant waste of time about details about another giant waste of time. And it's, it's not that this shouldn't be talked about at all, but it's like the number one story, go turn on CNN or MSNBC or look at the New York Times today and, or like the Washington Post or any of these outlets. And I, that's just one story. That's just one story. We also have this whole Jared Kushner story, which is like, oh, Jared Kushner is going to testify in front of the Senate because he met with some Russian officials uh, during the uh, interim between the election and the and the uh, and President Trump taking office. Which is like, okay, well, he was going to be one of the top people in the White House, so it's pretty normal, from what I understand, for for top like people in the incoming in, in, in the incoming administration to meet with you know representatives. Of, of foreign countries, and it's just like that to me is going to turn up nothing as well. And everybody's all, all talking about that. There was a 13. Oh, and then this morning there was this whole thing again about the investigation related to that, which is like the Washington Post had this big story about how the White House told Sally Yates that she wasn't, she couldn't test. They tried to prevent her from testifying to I think it's the House Intelligence Committee, not the Senate Intelligence one, but that the White House tried to prevent Sally Yates from testifying in this investigation. 
information. Like, and it's just, and the White House has come out and said, well, no, we didn't try to prevent her from testifying. Now, there's this letter out that the Washington Post had that said, where the White House says, well, some of the stuff she might say in this testimony could be covered by uh, White House, like, privilege communications regulations, so she should check with us first before testifying. But that's not trying to prevent her from testifying. But anyways, it's just, it's another thing like the Kushner thing and the Sally Yates thing and the Devin Nunes thing, to me, they're just, it's like, again, I use the phrase giant waste of time about something that's just related to another giant waste of time. Ultimately, I don't think personally this, this, these investigations are going to turn up much. And now we're spending all this time arguing about these stories, not, not even the investigation, like stories about the investigation. It's just, oh, and I'm sorry I'm getting so upset this morning, but it's just like, it's just this constant... And it's, it's, it's nonstop, go, again, turn on your TV and look at the papers and stuff. And it's not even like, my upsetness is not like, oh, these are unfair charges or oh, like the liberals are like attacking people unfairly. It's more just like, it's just all this energy and effort is being spent on these things that don't help the country at all and are a giant waste of time and aren't going to make a difference anyway. Like, I honestly don't think whether Sally Yates testifies or not, or whether some of her testimony, whether she can fully testify or has to, like, not say certain stuff because it's covered by White House privilege, I don't really think that's going to, and whether the White House, you know, whatever the White House said to her, I don't think that's really going to make a big difference in terms of what's found out about this Russia connection thing, because I don't really think there's much to be found out. Same with whether Devin Nunes oh, heads the House Intelligence committee investigation to this or not, it's not going to make a big difference. And it's just a, like, and it, it reminds me of like when everybody was all upset like for a few days about it. the biggest thing in the world for a few days was like, Jeff Sessions should recuse himself from the Justice Department investigation into the Russian interference in the election. Like that was the biggest deal in the world. And then he finally just said, okay, I recuse myself and we, we never heard about it again. Um, but it's like, that wasn't going to make a big difference either. And it's just all of this time and energy and every all this media coverage is just on this stuff which I don't think ultimately will amount to anything and it's just time that like the media and like people and Democrats could be focused on like more important issues to our country and, and fine if they want to talk this stuff about a little and you want to write an article about it fine 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 I'm not saying don't write anything about it but it's just the sheer amount of time and effort and energy being put into this by everybody just seems like not it's, it's, who cares? Focus on stuff that's going to be more important for like Americans to be benefited by. You know, if you want to spend all your, if Democrats want to spend all their time in the media talking about the issues, now they can feel free to disagree with the Trump administration about it, fine, but at least you're talking about like important issues that are going to affect Americans rather than like issues about an investigation that's ultimately not going to really make much of a difference at all. And personally, I think what's probably really driving this is that a lot of these people, both in the media and, and on the Democratic side, hate Trump so much that they like, this is like their one chance. It's like, if we can just show that he colluded with Russia on the election, then we can get him out of office or something. It just feels like at a certain point it all goes back to that, and that's why they spend all this time on this. But it's just, it doesn't really help the country to me. So, you know, anyways. All right, that was a bit of a rant, but I'm kind of upset about it. And it just, it just feels like, again, a, I'll say it again, a giant waste of time about a giant waste of time. So you know where I stand on all these stories today. And this is why I was saying I feel like it's going to be so much of Spicer press briefing is going to be the questions on the Devin Nunes and on the Kushners, on the Sally Yates. And it's just like enough already. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> Driving me nuts. Okay, so anyways, I uh, would love to hear what you think about all this. Uh, if you want to write in, um, feel free. My information's on there uh, on the bottom of the screen. You can direct message. If you want to write in, send in your comments. Maybe you disagree with me about all this. Uh, send in your comments. Send in your questions. Uh, we'd love to read them on the air here during this pre-show for the Sean Spicer Press Briefing, which will start in about a half an hour. We'll have it for you live. If you want to write to me, you can either direct message me on Twitter at Lookner at L-O-O-K-N-E-R, or uh, email me at Steve dot lookner at rsbn.tv and uh, yeah those are the ways you can reach me let me just make sure I'm all caught up here with everything and I want to sorry I got to pull my email up here 
And there's some other things to talk about today that are going to be talked about in the briefing besides the stuff I was just complaining about, which is all, which is just driving me absolutely bonkers today. But I need to call up, I need to pull up my notes. So there is one thing that's going to be asked about in the briefing that I do feel like uh, is a little more important for our country, and that is uh, the President Trump's executive order that he's going to sign today. So President Trump, we're going to be carrying this live here at some point too. Well, the way it won't be live is if, if it and the briefing are happening at the same time, we'll have to broadcast the president signing the executive order after the Trump the Spicer briefing, but any or on a different window or something. But anyways, President Trump is signing an executive order today about energy. Uh, specifically, he's the executive order is going to uh, roll back a number of climate uh, change related energy regulations that President Obama put into place and or that happened under the Obama administration and for example the, on the, under the Obama administration they came out with this thing called the Clean Power Act and the Clean Power Act the purpose of it is to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions uh, from power generation, from power plants, over the next few decades. And one of the things that would happen due to these, this Clean Power Act is that you would have a lot less coal being used in power plants and more, say, natural gas to power power plants or alternative sources like uh, renewable sources like wind and uh, what else is there? Wind solar. So the idea is that a big effect of this clean power plan, if it was put through, would be to reduce the amount of coal being used to power our nation's power plants and produce power. And now this Clean Power Act that, that was declared under the Obama administration has not actually been put into effect yet because there's a question about whether it's constitutional or not. Uh, the Supreme Court actually put out a temporary restraining order uh, from this Clean Power Act going into effect. Uh, and the, the courts are dealing with this question of whether it's constitutional or not. I won't get into the details right now as to what the whole details around that case are. But while it's not in effect, it could be in theory put into effect if the Supreme, if, if the court system ultimately rules, the federal court system rules, that it is constitutional. But part of what President Trump's executive order would do today is instruct I think it's the Department of Energy, but it would instruct the federal government, whatever branches are responsible, to uh, revisit that Clean Power uh, Act uh, and Clean Power Plan. And ultimately, the idea would be to start the procedures necessary to undo the Clean Power Plan and to rescind it. Oh wow! That's right. So I so and, and before I continue on this, I just want to point out we just got a wonderful donation from Anna from a hundred dollars uh, in our chat room. So that was super nice of you. I really appreciate it. And uh, Joanna, I'm sorry, Joanna. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, wow, that's super that's super cool of you. And now uh, and I'll get back to the to the Clean Power Act and the Executive Order thing in a minute. But just so everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so we do rely on your support to stay on the air here at Right Side Broadcasting. Without your donations, we would not be on the air. So if you feel like you enjoy our coverage and you want to support us at any time, we would of course really appreciate it because it helps us stay on the air and it would help us bring this kind of coverage to you. So uh, easiest way to do that is, which I'm guessing Joanna did, uh, is uh, if you're watching the coverage, next to the coverage is a chat room. At the bottom of a chat room, there's a dollar sign. If you just click on the dollar sign, you can uh, you can make it really easy for you to donate. So just click on the dollar sign below the chat room. Also, if you want, you can go to rsbn.tv slash donate, rsbn.tv slash donate. That makes it easy to donate too. Uh, and as I said yesterday, you know, every donation helps no matter how small. And honestly, if if everybody who watched like one of our rallies donated a dollar, that would like fund us for like a year. Honestly, I mean, uh, w roughly speaking, because our rallies get different amounts of viewers. So don't think if you're, you know, thank you, Joanna, for that donation. That's amazing. Uh, but don't think, well, I can only donate like a small donation. That's not going to matter. No, it does matter, and it adds up. And so we really appreciate it, Joanna, and everybody out there. Thank you to the moderators for moderating the chat, by the way. Anyway, so that was a little digression, but it's important to say because you guys keep us on the air. So getting back to the... Uh, executive order today. Uh, a main part of what this executive order Trump is going to sign, is going, President Trump is going to sign, is going to do, is to start the process of getting rid of the clean power plan. Uh, and um, another part of the, the, I think there's three big parts of this executive order. Uh, 
Another one is that it's going to, and I wrote this down so I got it right, uh, rescind the moratorium on coal mining on U.S. federal lands. So uh, coal, right now there's no coal mining allowed on U.S. federal lands, and this executive order will rescind that, and so coal mining will be allowed on federal lands. And there's also another thing the ex executive order is going to do. It's going to, and I'll quote it here, uh, this was, I believe this was, uh, this is so this I got from a CNN article, but I think this was a quote from the government, which said an intention was to inten identify all regulations, all rules, all policies that serve as obstacles and impediments to American energy independence. And I also know that uh, that part of this executive order, the purpose of it, part of the purpose is to is to improve uh, is to uh, is to improve the economy and also by help people get jobs. So specifically in the coal industry. So. You could see this executive order overall as the general idea of it is fewer regulations uh, on the energy industry which were designed to combat climate change, and these regulations were put in by the Obama administration. Fewer of these for the benefit of, uh, of, fr of freeing up the energy industry, for specifically freeing up the coal industry, and also allowing uh, well, sorry, freeing up the energy industry, but by doing so, allowing coal uh, to do better than it would have done if these regulations had been in place. So in theory, part of this, uh, part of the purpose of this executive order is to get more jobs for people in the coal industry, coal miners, that kind of thing out there. And this is, President Trump has talked about this. He talked about it during the campaign, wanting to help the coal industry out. He didn't think the Democratic administration, uh, the previous one, President Obama or Hillary Clinton, would be friendly to people who worked in the coal industry, and he wants to help them out. So uh, that's a purpose, that's one of the purposes of this uh, executive order that's going to be signed today. So I'm guessing Sean Spicer will be asked about that since it's going to be signed today. We'll see. Uh, and uh, it's just to give you a time check, it's right now 1234 Eastern, 1234 p.m. Eastern. So in 26 minutes, we will have Sean Spicer's press briefing for you live here at Right Side Broadcasting. Then after that, we're going to try to do it so that we can show Hopefully, if they don't overlap, President Trump signing the energy executive order today, and we'll try. We'll try to. We'll try to. Ideally, we'll have one right after the other, and then I'll come back here for the post show where we'll be taking some of your calls. For now, we'd love to hear your comments on any of the stuff going on today, uh, the energy executive order. Uh, all this stuff about the Russia investigation, which makes my head explode, but maybe you want to talk about some of that stuff that I was ranting about about 10 minutes ago. Uh, if you want to, shoot me an email or a direct message on Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at, at Lookner at L-O-O-K-N-E-R. And on, uh, on my email is steve.lookner at rsbn.tv. We'd love to hear from you. And read your comment on the air. This is from, uh, let's see, now Tannis, what did you send me? Tannis just sent me, uh, uh, this is why Devin Nunes was at the White House. There's a link to a video, and then Tannis says, the shifts, uh, or I think it's skiffs, I'm not, or skiffs or shifts, I'm not sure, secure rooms on the Hill are compromised. So a whistleblower met, South Nunes, met Nunes in the skiff at the White House. They are encouraging all whistleblowers to do this, details in this video. So I'm not, I can't watch the video right now because I'm on the air, uh, Tannis, but thank you for rem reminding me about this whole thing. So, uh, Devin Nunes had an explanation for why he was at the White House. Remember, Devin Nunes said he got the information about this, this surveillance stuff that had been released. There was surveillance supposedly released uh, that involved President Trump and his associates, and Devin Nunes, Devin Nunes was ex uh, upset that this surveillance information got widely distributed in the government. And, but he got this information about the surveillance from a source, and he got it at the, uh, on a building on the White House grounds. And you might wonder, why did he do that? Devin Nunes said, well, he went to the White House because there are only limited locations where that have access to this information where this information can be called up and shown. So it's not like somebody handed Devin Nunes a document. This information is classified information and it needs to be shown to, in a secure location. And Devin Nunes also said, and this is what you're talking about, Tannis, that I, I had heard Devin Nunes had said that this, somebody, because somebody, you might ask, well, why, there, there are these secure locations in, on Capitol Hill as well. Why didn't he just go to one of those instead of the White House? And I believe what he had said was that uh, the, 
this information was only shared in the executive branch and it wasn't shared in the legislative branch, so he couldn't go to Capitol Hill and get this information. That's why he had to go to the White House. But larger point here is Devin Nunes does have an explanation for why he went to the White House to get this information. And the, inf the explanation is not, well, because like President Trump handed me the information or something. So now you might not buy his explanation. I don't know. I'm just saying he has an explanation. And you link to a video, Tannis, but I can't click the video and watch it right now because I'm occupied doing this show, but I'll, I'll check it out later. So thank you, Tannis Ashling, for writing in. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm just checking here, making sure I'm caught up on email. Okay, all good there. And time check, it is 11, well, 1237 Eastern. So in 23 minutes, we will have, sh oh, I'm sorry. Did I get it? Was I off by a minute, Micah? But Mike, did you say 52 minutes? No, oh, okay, yeah. I, I, my, my, my clock said 11.37. We were a minute off in the, between our clocks. I'm on my iPad clock. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's now 22 minutes until Sean Spicer's briefing starts, and we will bring that to you live here at Right Side Broadcasting. Um, what else did we want to talk about? You know, I'm wondering uh, if... Oh, let me... I, I, have, I have a point I want to say here. This is not a Sean Spicer-specific point, but it's a point... It's a point that relates to media coverage uh, that I wanted to bring up. So I was looking at the New York Times this morning, and, uh, and they had a big story on, on Medicaid and uh, on, like, on sort of the history of Medicaid and how it started out as a small... Well, the story was kind of two things in one. On the one hand, it was like a history of Medicaid and how it started off as like a small program. It was like added on. It was seen as like this add-on when uh, Lyndon Johnson... Uh, got Medicare instituted, and it's really, it didn't cover that many people, and it's like grown and grown and grown and grown and grown until this, to this big program that covers, I believe, 9% of the American population. No, sorry, it's more than that. I think it's like, tw it might be 20% of people in America. It's like 9% of the federal budget, I believe. So, uh, so it's, but I think it's, I think the article said it covered like 20% of the American population uh, got some Medicaid benefits. So, but it's, so, so I actually like that part of the article because it's a nice little historical overview. Although, but the second part of the article was like just like this defense of Medicaid, sort of this implied defense. And the article did this thing that I've seen so much uh, when the health care bill was talked about in general and generally in general when like pro proposed go proposed cuts to government programs are talked about and this is talked about so i've seen this in discussion of like medicaid and medicare and like also like cuts to health subsidies what other programs have i seen this oh like when there's proposals about you know cutting meals on wheels or cutting uh you know nih funding or whatever you this is i see these defenses of them and the defense basically consists of pointing out cases where the proposed program helps people. So basically, like in this New York Times article, the implied defense of Medicaid was like, they would tell you about a specific person. They'd be like, look at this person. This person uh, has this condition. And without this condition, they would not be covered for this like certain drug, which lets them you know, work and go to work every day. And there's like several, in this article, there's like several specific cases where they show the person's picture and they say, without Medicaid, this person wouldn't have this. Uh, and this approach is taken like with Meals on Wheels, where it's like, without Meals on Wheels, and they show a picture of like an old person, like, this person, no one would bring them food, uh, and they would be lonely and stuff. And the, it's like, the implication, what drives me nuts about this, is the implication here is like, the people wanting to cut this pro these programs like either don't know that they help people or don't care about them helping people. That's the implication. Like, well, if you actually did know that the program did these things and helped these people, then you'd never want to cut it. So if you want to cut it, that's because you either don't know it helps these people or you don't care about these people. And that's just false. It's utterly false. And it's like, it's just bad reasoning. And here's why it's bad reasoning, because, which I'm sure a lot of you just know right as, I'm, right as I bring it up, um, when, Repu when people want a, to cut a government program, so for example, when Republicans say we want less government spending on health healthcare or me like Medicaid specifically, or we want to cut Meals on Wheels, it's not because like they hate sick people or they hate old people, don't care about them. The point is that there's a cost 
to government spending on programs, and there's a cost, there's a cost to government spending on in general. There's a negative effect of government spending. This negative effect, there's negative, there's potential negative effects, plural. The negative effects could be uh, it slows down the economy because government spending requires taxation. Maybe if you raise taxes, people work less, the economy slows down. Also, you might argue that government spending, uh, mandating certain money gets spent on a certain thing. That might not be the most efficient way of spending that money in terms of benefit versus cost. Uh, so there's that whole thing as well. Um, you know, so like uh, there's, plen there's plenty of arguments to be made that more government spending is not the best way, best thing for the country overall. And somebody might argue, for example, they might argue, look, uh, instead of spending a lot of money, what the government should do is just not spend a lot of money uh, and uh, not spend as much money and tax people less and then the economy gets better and ultimately we get even more revenue and that'll just, that'll be better for everyone including, including the people who Medicaid helps and including the people who Meals on Wheels helps. The idea is if the economy is better, uh, that helps everybody. Then there's more money to pay for programs and you know, and, and it's just more for everyone and so, the basic point here is you can, it's perfectly consistent for Republicans or whoever to say, I want to cut government spending or I want to cut these government programs and yet still really care and want the best for and sympathize with sick people, old people, or anyone else who's benefited by government programs. Because what these people might say is, look, uh, Ultimately, the best way to help the Americans who are being supp supported by these government programs is to cut the government programs. And that might sound odd, but the idea would be but if we cut the programs, we can maybe make the economy much better, or maybe there's different ways of providing these services that these programs provide that are more efficient and produce more benefits for less cost. So there's all these different arguments that could be made uh, for cutting government programs where the people making those arguments still ultimately want to benefit the people who the programs benefit. So just saying, look, you can't, you shouldn't cut Medicaid because it helps this person and it helps this person and it helps this person. The people who want to cut it, they're not denying that. They're not denying that Medicaid helps these people. What they're, what they're claiming is it'll be better for everyone, including these people, if the government doesn't spend so much money on these programs. So it just, it drives me bonkers when I see argu arguments against cutting these things. This happens so much. I mean, I, I have, I look at the news media and also I have like tons of, uh, friends of mine who you know are a lean liberal and like I see their posts on Facebook and so many of the arguments about is it really even well I guess it's an argument but so many of the arguments in the posts which are directed at uh, which are like anti making Medicaid cuts or anti making health care cuts or anti making any cuts are like it but it helps this person how can you want to hurt this person and, it, and it's as if like the people proposing the cuts like don't care about those people and don't want to help them. And it's just, ugh, anyways. So it's just, when, when you make that kind of argument, when you say, don't make these cuts because it helps these people. See these people, it's helping them. I'm gonna show you how it helps them. When you make these cuts, um, when you make these cuts, uh, if you argue that making these cuts is bad because it helps these people, you're not even listening to the argument from the people who want to make the cuts. You're not even listening to their argument because their argument is making the cuts will make be better for everyone, including the people who get help by these programs. Okay, uh, I've been I've been very ranty this morning, so but these two things were kind of bothering me, and I wanted to talk about them. Uh, uh, I just got handed a note uh, by my producer, and I just want to make I want to read it and just make sure I am understanding it. Um, Micah, could you clarify this for me? Because, say, say it in my ear. Yes? All right, so Micah, our producer Micah had a comment here on this. And Micah, your comment, I want to make sure I get it right. Your comment is that uh, 
Donations in three days covered the federal portion of Meals on Wheels, correct? Right, and I guess, and, and Micah, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm guessing an argument you might be, that could be made based on this is that, look, this is, a, this is something that could have been covered by the private sector, which the government was covering, and maybe, and maybe if the government wasn't covering it, private sector would cover it. So that's an argument somebody can make too. But again, that would be an argument. Somebody who made that argument isn't saying, I hate all the people who are covered by Meals on Wheels and I don't care about them. That's not the argument. So thank you, Micah, for... Uh, for writing in. By the way, a, a shout out to Micah. We haven't given your Twitter address in a while. I know a number of you follow Micah Messer, but if you want to follow Micah Messer, our producer, it is at Micah J. Messer on Twitter. Micah, I think I got that right. Let me know if I got it wrong. At Micah J. Messer. M-I-C-A-H-J-M-E-S-S-E-R. Uh, thank you, Micah. And uh, all right. I apologize for all the ranting this morning. I had a couple things I, I want. I usually don't get that upset on the show, but these things have been bothering me over time. So it's 11.47, uh, sorry, 12.47, 12.48, 12.48 Eastern Time. In 12 minutes, we will have the uh, Sean Spicer press briefing live. It's going to be full screen. It won't just be over my shoulder. It'll be full screen. And you can watch it. And then at the conclusion of that, hopefully we will have President Trump signing his energy executive order. And then, and then we will come back for the post show and talk about all this and take some of your calls. Looking forward to that. And in the meantime, we would love to hear your comments about what's going on today, what Sean Spicer might be asked about. Also, feel free to write to me during the press briefing. Like if you hear a question and it bothers you, or there's something Sean Spicer says you find is particularly interesting and you want to comment on it, you can write to me during the press briefing as well as right now, as well as after the press briefing. Uh, I'd love to read your comment on the air. You can reach me at at Luckner on Twitter, at L-O-O-K-N-E-R, or you can email me at steve.luckner at rsbn.tv. Either of those ways to reach me, you can reach me there. Uh, Joanne Goldsnyder writes in, thank you for clearing up Meals on Wheels for me. Now I have the facts. I'm guessing you're thanking uh, Micah because he says, gave me that note. But if you're thanking me and Micah, you're welcome, Joanne. Thank you for watching. So now, obviously, there's, there's plenty of more facts about Meals on Wheels, and I, I don't want to have claim to cover all the facts about this program, but my, pro, my point was a more general point about how I think a lot of the arguments uh, against people who are uh, Republican proposals for cutting government spending are bad arguments. Thanks, Julian, for writing in. Now let me check real quick. Uh, we have a comment from David Opst. David Opst writes in, uh, Steve, I have a theory. What do you think of it? I do not think Putin would want a president with the policies of President Trump. Uh, building up our economy, strengthening our military, and trying to keep radical Islamists out of our country. The Russians are good chess players who think many moves ahead. Could they have conducting a, conducted a phishing attract? Not sure if that is considered hacking on Podesta's email account just to cause the problems that are happening now. He might have not thought that Trump would win, but if he did win, he would have had to slow this down or stop the Trump's administration. Or maybe he did want him to win for the same reason. This might be over the top, but devious people do think like this. Call me crazy. Uh, David, I I think this is a perfectly reasonable thing to ask. I think it's a very interesting proposal. What, what, you're, what you're proposing, David, you're saying, look, there are reasons one might see that Putin would not want President Trump to be president. Uh, we can make an argument. Now, maybe I could see an argument on both sides. But, you know, you, you could say, you, you could imagine a world in which, you know, President Trump wants to be strong in defense, and maybe there's a world in which Putin thinks, you know, President Trump is, would, would, would be strong in defense and maybe he'd be a little unpredictable and like he he might be more well you know maybe, maybe I, I just I won't go to the whole thing but we could imagine we could imagine Putin thinking having having the thought yeah I don't think it would be better to have Trump as president and what you're proposing David very interesting you're saying is it possible that all like this that so let's say Russia was responsible for like the John Podesta email links uh, and Russia was responsible for the DNC hacked. Instead of doing that stuff to make Hillary lose and Clinton and, and Trump win, could Russia have been doing that just so when Hillary won, it would totally weaken her administration? Uh, now, one way to weaken her administration would be to like make the vote closer. So if Hillary won like in a narrow victory, and half the country was upset with her over some, in part because of some of the email stuff, that would certainly make her administration weaker and less likely to, you know, get stuff passed in Congress and stuff. And since Hillary was very anti-Putin and anti-Russia, 
that certainly would be a plausible thing for Russia to do. And I think most people thought that Hillary was going to win the election. And it's certainly reasonable to think that in Russia, they thought Hillary was going to win the election. So I think your theory is it's certainly worthy of being put out there as a possible reason for Russia to have interfered in the election. And you know, now that I hear the theory, it's, it's, it's something which I think should be talked about more. It's like there's, there is this assumption widespread in the media, because whenever they talk about Russia interfering in the election, the idea is that they would have infer interfered to make Trump win. But like, it seems like a perfectly reasonable argument could be constructed that uh, they would interfere to weaken Hillary. If anything, that seems a bit at least as plausible, if not more plausible than the other way, because Hillary was seen as so much of a favorite in the election. And you have to assume that in Russia, they probably assumed that it was more possible than not than probable than not that Hillary would win the election. So I really like this email, David. Uh, and if nothing else, I think it's a it's an example of something which is an entirely plausible proposal that should be talked about in the media if they were discussing things intelligently, which they're not most of the time. So uh, I really do appreciate that email. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, seven minutes, according to my clock, until the uh, briefing starts. Sean Spicer Press Briefing. We're going to cover it for you live here. We cover them all live. And uh, I don't even think I got to all the stuff I thought he was going to talk about today. Let me go back to my notes here. And if you want... Feel free, we still have a few minutes, so if you'd like to get in a comment or question about what do you think uh, Sean Spicer will talk about in the briefing or just some of the news that's going on today, let me know. Shoot me an um, email or a direct message. The inf info is right down there on your screen. I didn't know if um, Sean Spicer might be asked again about the Russia protest. Is that, uh, you know, so, so these Russia protests happened this weekend. There were bigger protests than had happened in Russia for about, than had happened for about five or six years. Uh, these protests were against corruption in the Putin government. And a lot of people were surprised at how big the protests were. And, uh, you know, Sean Spicer was asked about it yesterday. And he, I think, if I'm, am I getting this right? If I'm remembering it right, I want to say he quoted uh, the State Department s statement on this at some point. I feel like he did that, but I can't remember if he did it in the briefing or not. Anyways, but uh, I'm wondering if just that'll be asked about again. And, and maybe, you know, I, I do think it's an important story. And whether or not it's going to be asked about again, I do think it's an important story to keep an eye on. And there was actually a very interesting article. Now, sometimes I'll say, you know, I read the New York Times. You might be like, why are you reading the New York Times if you hate the New York Times? And I do think the New York Times is, is, has gotten very biased and basically thrown away all of their great reputation in the last couple of years for who knows what, and I don't know why they did it. But, uh, uh, but anyways, uh, the New York Times does still have some informative articles in it. And one article I thought was quite informative is they had an article today about how uh, the protesters in Russia, people were surprised at how young a lot of them were. Uh, it was a much more younger skewing protest than had been the norm in, in Russia, uh, and, and I specifically the, the protests in Moscow. And where this is important is that, you know, in Russia, there's a lot of control put on the media by the state. Uh, it's not a very free media, and a lot of people just watch the state media, and that's very, that's very biased coverage. But the, what 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 this article was saying is for young people, they don't get their media the traditional way like a lot of older people do. They don't just like watch the state news television channel. They're getting it on the internet. And presumably, if they're getting it on the internet, they, ha they maybe have figured out how to get access to some sources that, I don't know what the deal with internet censorship is there, but perhaps they have access to sources besides the ones, uh, they're, they're frequently consulting sources that are different from the ones that are influenced by the Russian government. And maybe they're getting, so maybe the Russian government is limited in how much they can control the media coverage when it comes to what younger people are reading and looking at. And if that's the case, that suggests that perhaps their whole media control operation won't work as well in the coming years as this younger population gets older. I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Uh, I thought it was a neat point. So that article's in the New York Times today if you want to read about that. Okay, we have about four minutes left. Four minutes until Sean Spicer's press briefing. 
Uh, oh, uh, Sherry, Miss Sherry says, Steve, you're extremely passionate about the subject matter today. It's not ranting. Well, I'm glad you don't consider it ranting, uh, Sherry. I am passionate about it because it's been bothering me for a couple days. So uh, I guess you're saying if, if you consider the word rant, hold on, I need a drink here for a second, a drink of water. I guess if you consider ranting like crazed, unrestrained, just nutty talk, I wasn't, I don't think I was doing that. But I appreciate your, uh, your comment, Sherry, so thank you. So maybe, uh, so maybe I won't use the word ranting if you don't think I should use it, but uh, um, uh, thank you for the comment, Miss Sherry. Much appreciated. I feel a little better now. Uh, let's check my email real quick, make sure I've gotten all your messages on there. Oh, we have another one, let's see here. Let's see. Um, this is from Greg, Greg Jackson. Greg says, uh, anecdotal stories are not news. It's only a method to spin a story or narrative. What is left out is we send trillions to the government in order for the government to send it back to the people. In other words, money is sent to Washington in order for them to take their cut. It is why Washington is the richest in the country. The documentary Boomtown really showed how this works. Also, by sending all this money to Washington, it allows the local politicians to blame the federal government, absolving them of, every, of any responsibility. This is the most prevalent in the education spending. Local authorities blame Washington for local ills. So, uh, so thank you, uh, Greg, for the message. Uh, the first part of your message, the first thing you say is anecdotal stories are not news. And I think you might be referring to what I was talking about before when, like, there's an article about how Medicaid cuts are bad, but it's just, like, anecdotal stories about three people helped by Medicaid, and you're saying that's not news. Uh, we can have a debate about whether it's news, but I, as I was saying before, I don't think that's a good argument against cutting Medicaid, that it helps some people, because the people who want to cut it wouldn't deny that it helps some people. Um, but then you also say uh, you do have a problem with uh, sending... You, you think that, in general, having a lot of government spending is problematic because it involves us taxpayers sending a lot of the money to the government and you have some issues with what the government does with it and what ends up resulting from all that money being sent to the government. So uh, thank you for your input, Greg. Uh, and again, this is just another example of if people don't want government spending cut, it's not because they don't care about the people the government money is being spent on. It's, I think, and I know for me, that's my view, and I, from, a, for a lot, from a lot of people out there who I've read and listened to, a lot of people want government spending cut because they think the best way to help everyone, including the money that the government, including people who are currently the benefit of government programs, people who want to, a lot of people who want to cut spending think the best way to help everyone is to cut government spending. And maybe it's not like, you know, the, another problem here is like, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to point at like, this person is getting this specific benefit from Medicaid. They're getting these shots. It's like this concrete benefit. But it's not so easy if, you, if, if like the GDP increases by a couple points because government spending isn't that high and taxes aren't that high. Uh, that's, a, that's not as good of a visual because what are you going to point to, like a graph where the GDP goes up? It's basically rather than, it's like, it's like benefits that are harder to like take a picture of. Uh, but you shouldn't, you know, that doesn't mean that the benefits are, aren't just as important, if not more important. You know, if the, if the, if the economy improves, that's better for everyone. So uh, we're going to the briefing. Enjoy the briefing. I'll see you after the briefing in the executive order. Have, enjoy it.
while you wait. <laughs> Thank you. You done? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I know the pool's gathering at 1.30, so I'm going to try to keep this on the short end. Uh, this morning, the president had a listening session with the attorney generals and the fraternal or police with the vice president to discuss law enforcement issues related to terrorism and inner city violence. The Fraternal Order of Police is the world's largest organization of law, uh, sworn law enforcement officers with more than 330,000 members. They represent those who dedicate their lives to protecting and serving. They advocate for improved working conditions for law enforcement officers and for the safety of our communities. The President thanked the FOP leadership for their support and reaffirmed his pledge to have our back. The President also remarked that his highest duty is the security of our people and pointed to several actions that he's already taken to enhance the, our domestic security, including the creation of a task force to, on reducing violent crime, an interagency task force to dismantle criminal cartels, and historic action to secure our borders and remove criminals from our country. The group held an in-depth discussion about the rise of violent crime in some parts of the country, the disturbing increase in members of law enforcement being targeted ambush-style attacks, and the need to address the country's opioid academic epidemic, excuse me. Uh, Attorney General Sessions told the FOP leadership that he looks forward to continuing to work closely with them to tackle the challenges facing law enforcement as they work to keep our community safe. This afternoon, as I mentioned at the top, the President will sign an executive order on energy independence at the Environmental Protection Agency headquarters. The President strongly believes that protecting the environment and promoting our economy are not mutually exclusive goals. This executive order will help to ensure that we have clean air and clean water without sacrificing economic growth and job creation. First, it directs all agencies to conduct a review of all regulation, rules, policies, and guidance documents that put up roadblocks to domestic energy production and identify the ones that are not either mandated by law or actually contributing to the public good. It also rescinds a number of, pre of the previous administration's action that don't reflect this administration's priorities. The full list is laid out in the executive order, which will be provided to you later today after the President signs it. Next, the order directs the EPA to take several actions to reflect this President's environmental, environmental and economic goals, including a review of the new performance standards for coal-fired and natural gas-fired plants that amount to a de facto ban on new coal plant production in the United States. This is great news for states like Wyoming, West Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and others. Finally, the order establishes a directive for agencies to use the best available science and economics in their regulatory analysis moving forward. For too long, the federal government has acted like a barrier to energy independence and innovation. By reducing unnecessary <coughs> regulatory obstacles, we'll free up American energy companies to responsibly use our vast energy resources, protecting the environment while creating well-paying jobs throughout the country. American electricity producer, producers have already done an amazing job of adapting and utilizing new technologies to deliver clean, clean power to the United States. Under President Trump, the federal government is going to acknowledge that, prog that progress and adjust its priorities accordingly. Moving on, later this afternoon, the President will meet with Secretary of State Tillerson 
and Secretary of Homeland Security Kelly. And this evening, the President and the First Lady will host a reception here in the White House for senators and their spouses. Uh, this will be the first time that President Trump has invited all current senators to the White House, and he looks forward to this opportunity, as well as to speak with some of the senators about the places where they can come together and make this country better. One of those places that he hopes to find common ground with Senate Democrats here tonight is the confirmation of Judge Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. Yesterday, many Senate Democrats began declaring support for Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer's partisan filibuster of Judge Gorsuch. And as I've said, these senators should get, if these senators get their way, this will be the first successful filibuster of a nominee to join the Supreme Court. Leading Democrats have lamented these tactics as recently as last year. Senator Schumer, in fact, wrote last year in an op-ed in the New York Daily News, and I quote, at a time when Americans want to move forward, the last thing we need, uh, the last thing is a new recipe for gridlock at the Supreme Court. Democrat nominee Hillary Clinton said of the Supreme Court confirmation progress, quote, it should not be an exercise in political brinksmanship and partisan posturing, and that nominees deserve a, quote, full and fair hearing, hearing followed by a vote. Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri tweeted, the Constitution says the Senate shall advise and consent, and that means having an up or down vote. So who are Senate Democrats going to enact this uh, on an extraordinary lengths to block? It's an individual, frankly, who their body, including Senator Schumer, unanimously confirmed for a seat on the Tenth Circuit not too long ago. This is a judge who received a unanimous, well-qualified rating by the American Bar Association was a Harvard Law graduate who received the Edward J. Randolph Award for Outstanding Service at the Department of Justice. So it can't be their qualifications they're taking issue with. Judge Gorsuch isn't frank, frankly a mainstream judge. Here are some figures and stats to point that out. Number one, in 98% of the cases in which he issued the opinion, he received the unanimous support of all of his colleagues. Second, in divided cases over the last five years involving both Republican and Democrat, appointed judges, Judge Gorsuch sided with the Democrat appointed judge one in three times. When the shoe was on the other foot, when a Supreme Court nominee for a Democratic president went through the confirmation hearings and meetings with senators from both parties, neither Justices Kagan nor Sotomayor faced an attempted Senate filibuster. Both received Republican votes in support of their confirmation. In fact, during the Kagan nomination on the Senate floor, when Senator Harry Reid planned to file a cloture motion to bring Kagan to a vote, it was then Senator and now current Attorney General Jeff Sessions who stopped him and said, quote, I have a high standard before I would attempt to block an up or down vote and asked Senator Reid to proceed with a vote without the need for overcoming a Republican filibuster. Judge Gorsuch had met with most of the Senate Democratic Caucus. He has gone through days of hearings and answered probing questions. He is eminently qualified and deserves the deference and consideration from the minority Senate Democrats the President Obama's selection were given once they had gone through the confirmation process. A few things I want to highlight. Uh, last night, the President announced his intent to no nominate uh, Makan uh, Delrahim to serve as Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division at the Department of Justice. And this morning, we announced the President's declaration that a major disaster exists in the state of Nevada and ordered federal assistance to supplement recovery efforts in the areas affected by severe storms, flooding, and mudslides this past February. And finally, this morning, the President was pleased to see that Ford announced $1.2 billion investment in three manufacturing facilities in Michigan just two weeks after automobile executives came to the White House and met with the President. This adds to the growing wave of positive news, jobs news under the President, and continued investment uh, from Charter Communications, his approval of the permit for Keystone XL pipeline on Friday. In addition, Energy Transfers Partners reported Monday that the Dakota Access Pipeline has been filled with oil as they enter the final stations, stages of preparation that will finally put this into service. According to data released by the conference board, in March, consumer confidence, quote, soared to its highest level in 16 years. And from individual announcements to significant boost in both consumer and CEO confidence generally, it's clear that the president's economic agenda is what America's businesses have been waiting for. These businesses have spent years being held back by unnecessary bureaucratic red tape. And what we're seeing now is just the taste of the heights our economy can reach once those burdens are removed. And lastly, I want to make a comment on a false report regarding former acting Attorney General Sally Yates. As a matter of fact, I'd like to walk you through the sequence of events just to make sure that everyone's abundantly clear on what happened. On March 14th, Chairman Nunez and Ranking Member Schiff invited Sally Yates to testify on March 28th. On March 23rd, Sally Yates' attorney sent a letter to the Department of Justice 
asking for their consent to testify without constraints. On March 24th, the Department of Justice responded that the President owns those privileges to discuss the communications they were requesting to talk about and referred them to the White House. Also on the 24th, Ms. Yates' attorney sent a letter to the White House counsel requesting that consent, specifically stating that if they did not receive a response by March 27th at 10 a.m., they would, quote, conclude that the White House does not assert executive privilege over these matters. The White House did not respond and took no action that prevented Ms. Yates from testifying. That's the story. That's what the documents show. And with that, I'm glad to take some questions. Of course you can, John Roberts. Uh, I'd like to follow on that. Because there, there are reports that even though the hearing that was set for the 27th was not scheduled, it was canceled by Devin Nunes to prevent this White House from publicly uh, invoking a claim of executive privilege. Could you speak to that? I hope she testifies. I look forward to it. It was never, they, let's be honest, the hearing was never, was actually never notified. If they choose to move forward, great. We have no problem with her testifying, plain and simple. The report in the Washington Post is 100% false. The letters that they frankly publish on their website all back up everything I just read. All of the letters are available on their website. I hate to give them the traffic. But the reality is, is that they specifically say, if you don't respond, we're gonna go ahead. We didn't respond, we encouraged them to go ahead. But to suggest in any way, shape, or form that we stood in the way of that is 100% false. Sean, Brian. Uh, a couple of things you said earlier, a couple quick follow-ups. You said you want uh, the agencies to use best available science. Does that mean there's gonna be no further scientific research? You don't wanna fund additional scientific research? And number two, what other issues do you like to see the president reach out to Democrats to tonight? Uh, so on the first one, best science is best science, and that's whatever's it's available. Is what you said, right? Well, if it's not available, it's tough to use it. Just well, as a matter I mean, of but is that a code for not using? Research? No, it's a code for it's got to be available. Um, that's it, plain and simple. You shouldn't read anything into that, and I think the president will speak more to that at um, when at, at today's signing um, at one thirty at two o'clock rather. I'm sorry. And as far as Democrats, um, what do you I, I think there's a whole host of issues. I talked yesterday about health care. If they want to come together on infrastructure, tax reform, we'd love to have as much support as possible. Amen. Thanks, John. Uh, a couple questions. One on coal. Uh, your actions today, the White House is saying that they're going to reverse President Obama's so-called war on coal. Uh, but a lot of people in the coal industry suggest that jobs are just not going to come back in that industry based on the way the industry has changed, technology, and other things. Does this administration have an estimate of how many jobs will be created as a result of the actions it's taken today? I'm not aware of one, an estimate. I know that the president has already met with some of the coal miners uh, the other day and, and Senators uh, Manchin and, and Capito in particular from West Virginia and others from Kentucky that were here that we did that EO signing a few days ago. Uh, I will tell you that from a mining perspective, uh, the miners and the owners are very, very bullish on this. So uh, the people who are actually in the business uh, applaud this effort, believe that it will do a lot to revive the industry. Uh, it's obviously a private industry, so I'm not going to get into who does what, but uh, I, I know that the industry itself said so. Steve, I'm sorry. On the point announcement, you just said that uh, the announcement today comes two weeks after the automakers met here at the White House. Did the White House or the President do anything in that meeting that led to this Ford announcement today? Um, I think there's been some regulatory effort and, and some commitments on the uh, regulatory efforts going forward um, in the in the future that I think uh, may have played a role I don't I would ask for it on that I just think it's a continued sign of it I think we have seen a number of uh, industry leaders union leaders um, truckers truck companies come in talk about burdens and I think there's been several cases where meetings in the White House or frankly we went to Michigan and held that round table out there as well um, that meetings that we have have a very positive follow-up in terms of a, a commitment from a company or an industry to create jobs, uh, to invest more in this country. But I, you know, in each of these cases, should the White House get political credit for this announcement today? I, I, I'll leave it up to Ford to, to make that determination. I think that we're obviously pleased with more Americans getting jobs uh, throughout various sectors, and I think that we'll continue. And the president has made it very clear that he continues to fight to bring back jobs and manufacturing here to the country. Steve. Looking seriously at tax reform, could you just go through what is the president's bottom line? Does it need to have middle class tax relief, corporate tax relief? Can you do it comprehensively or piecemeal? 
Uh, do you add infrastructure spending to it somehow? How do you? How are you looking at this? So on the first two, uh, those are both key components: the middle class individual tax piece of it, and then the corporate rate has to come down. I think those are guiding principles that the president has laid out. As far as how the process works, there are. I think the the you know, and I, I don't want to get ahead of. Uh, the, the folks in the legislative affairs or the guys on Capitol Hill, but I would suggest to you that there's a prevailing attitude out there that the FY18 reconciliation is probably the most likely vehicle to move some of this. Uh, again, I don't, what we want to do is keep a lot of options on the table in terms of do we put infrastructure in? Is there another vehicle to drive that? Um, but part of gathering folks together now from Capitol Hill, from industry, from, from groups is to begin that discussion to talk about what needs to go in, what the way forward is. Um, and, and so that that conversation has begun uh, and it's continuing. And when do you think you'll, you'll have some recommendations to take to the president? Well, I, internally, the team has, has been talking to him for a while. Um, I think there's a bigger discussion that has to happen as we branch out with, with outside groups, um, industry, members of Capitol Hill, et cetera, that, that start to formulate some additional listening that needs to happen on this um, and some and again I think part of it is there's a legislative strategy that needs to, to tie into this. Blake. Is the, uh, is the White House currently involved in any renegotiations of the health care bill and if so in, in what manner? Um, staff has met with individuals and listened to them um, so I don't know how detailed you want to I mean is are we have we had some discussions and listen to ideas yes um, are we actively planning an immediate strategy? Not at this time. I think there is a discussion that began, as I mentioned yesterday, of a lot of individuals on both sides of the aisle reaching out to both the president and key staff members um, to share ideas and, and additional ways forward. Um, so there has been a discussion, and, and I believe there will be several more. And what would you say to the, to the folks who have a genuine concern that if you could not get health care done, how do you go about getting big ticket items like tax reform and infrastructure done? People say, if, if you can't get one, how are you gonna do the next? What would you say to that concern? Well, again, I, I think, uh, as I, I mean, we're, we're gonna build a coalition for this. I think they're, each of them have different constituencies. And I think we're gonna work with uh, members of both sides of the aisle on both of those big ticket issues to, to see where we can find agreement and move forward. But I don't wanna prejudge um, the outcome at this point, John. Thank you, Sean. Oh. We'll do both. All right. I'll do first. I'll stick with the row and then I'll go to Matt. So straight up. Sorry, Francesca. John Gizzy. All right. Thank yeah, you, Francesca, Sean. Francesca, then John, then Matt. We'll just lucky day. Thank you, Sean. Um, just as a follow-up question on Blake's, did the president himself have any discussions with Speaker Ryan? or Leader McCarthy or anyone over the weekend about health care and making an actual vote on the American Health Care Act. And one got the impression from Speaker Ryan today that he was going to try to pass this with Republican votes, which would contradict some of your statements about reaching out to Democrats all along. Has any of this come up with discussions between each side of Pennsylvania Avenue? So I, I think I talked yesterday, they have spoken um, a few times um, about different strategies, different ideas, different policy aspects to the bill. Um, absolutely. Um, at least on a number of, at least two, maybe three times they've spoken. Um, and I know several of our staff members have also engaged in discussions again um, to, to talk about potential ways forward. So that those conversations have occurred. I think that's what I mentioned to Blake. I mentioned some of it yesterday. Um, and if we can find a way forward, we'll, we'll do it. But um, look, I don't think, just so we're clear, John, to your question, I'm not saying we've picked a strategy we're going to go with this group or that group. I think the president um, was, several people reached out and expressed an interest. Um, and the president's view is that he's willing to listen to them um, and hear what their ideas are. And, you know, I, I made a comment yesterday that was, uh, that just so we're clear, we, we have, let's call it, you know, 205, 207, somewhere in there, votes, right? Uh, maybe 210, depending on what it is. The, the point that I made yesterday is to get to 216, to get to 218, depending on the day of the week, 
um, there are certain things that people want that would take what I think the president views as a very good bill that weren't worth doing it because they would they would make the deal bad. And so the question is, can we add the additional votes um, with in ways that enhance the bill um, or bring people over that have been previous skeptics? But there's a way in which people are saying, hey, if you if you bring me on board with these five provisions, then I'm on board in which either a take people off the bill or don't make it as strong and make it a bad deal. And I think that's the balancing act that has to happen. One is, can you add a diff additional folks on without pushing additional folks off? And two is that in what you have to add to the bill, does it make it stronger or does it not? Because I think there are suggestions by some out there that have said, we're willing to come along to the bill, but in doing so, it would make it a bad deal. And that's that's an important aspect. It's, it's how do you take whatever that number is that we have now and get it up to 216 to pass without making, without losing people and or making it a bad deal. So hold on. And you hold on. I've already done with Republican votes, not Democrats. You know, well. However we get there, John, Francesca. Thank you, Sean. Yesterday you weren't able to tell us very much about Congressman Noon's visit to the White House or to the White House grounds to view classified information last week. Uh, a Democrat on the committee today said that the White House would have known that he was here. The same Democrat also said that it looked like a criminal cover-up to him. My question to you is, have you learned any more information since we had this conversation yesterday about how he would have even gotten in and how he would have gotten cleared? And do you think that Congressman Noon should recuse himself from being in charge of the Russia investigation at this point? Well, number one, on the latter part of that, it's not up to me. He's a member of the House. He's appointed by the Speaker, that is entirely up to the Speaker and the membership of the House of Representatives. I, we're not going to start commenting on, on that kind of stuff. Um, I do think that he is running an investigation, which we asked for. Um, and I think the thing that's important to note is there's somewhat of a double standard when it comes to classified information. When leaks are made illegally to the press and you all report them, the coverage focuses almost entirely on the substance of the allegation and that, that are part of an illegal leak, not on the illegal nature of the disclosure, the identity of the leaks or their agenda. But when the information that is occurring now, which is two individuals who are properly cleared or three or whoever he met with, I don't know, that they are sharing stuff that is entirely legal uh, with the appropriate clearances and then there's an obsession on the process. And it's sort of an, it's a, it's a backwards way that when you all report on stuff with sources that are leaking illegally leaking classified information, that's appropriate and fine. No one questions that, the substance of the material. When two individuals or however many are engaged in this process um, have a discussion that is 100% legal and appropriate and cleared, suddenly the obsession becomes about the process and not the substance. And I think that it is somewhat reckless in dis how, how the conversation over classified information um, is discussed without while sort of attempting to press a, a false narrative that exists. So while it is completely appropriate to share classified information um, with individuals who are cleared, uh, it is clearly not the case to do that with when it is illegally leaked out. And I think that's sort of the irony of how this whole conversation has gone. John. Thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, just following up on uh, your statement in regards to the Washington Post story that you say is false. White House uh, Counsel Office ever consider invoking privilege as it relates to Sally Yates testifying before this congressional committee? No. And why is that? You certainly would be in a position to invoke privilege. After all, these were privileged communications between the acting because, attorney general because, and the executive office of the president. That would fall. I know this would be a shocker, but again, part of it is is that I think that we've been very clear that when you actually get to the bottom of the facts, um, every single person who's been briefed on this, as I've said ad nauseum from this podium, that they've been very clear that there is no connection between um, the president or the staff here and, and anyone doing anything with Russia. And I think that the, the view here was great. Go share what you know. So no, and that's why the Washington Post should be ashamed of how it handled this story. It was 100% false. The letters that they actually published back up exactly what we're saying, that she was asked about this information, their attorney asked the, the, the DOJ, the DOJ said that she had to ask the White House. They made it very clear, if you don't do this, we are going to go forward. We had no objection to her going forward. That's it. Sean, I do, Sean, that's what's next. I get it. Sean, we're in order here. 
Um, just quickly following up on that, I have two questions on two different topics. Uh, yeah, so we're taking what you're saying, that's as assurances that Chairman Nunez's decision to call off that hearing did not have anything to do with any pressure from the White House? No. Okay, thank you. Um, on a different topic, we're seeing more states, Maine, uh, Virginia, and Kansas specifically, moving to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, joining the 30 plus states that have already done that. What's President Trump's message to Republican legislators uh, and legislators generally in those states now that the Affordable Care Act's future is so uncertain? I think there's a, there's a reason he explained to Congress and especially members uh, who have talked about entitlement expansion, why we should have passed this bill last week and why we need to address it now. This is a, is a major issue. It was one of our talking points, so I hope they, they listen. So he opposes expansion in these states. I, I think he, un, he understands that the way that, uh, the way that it was handled in terms of the able body provision under that right now are leading to uh, an implosion in, in, on that piece of the entitlement and that there was an opportunity to refocus it and to push the money and the, a lot of the authority back to the states to best determine how to handle issues within their states, um, both in terms of high risk pools and individuals um, that, that they wanted to cover. So it, it, we, frankly, the bill made it a much more states rights uh, program and a much more states' rights decision-making process in terms of how to care for the populations that they had to address. Cecilia. Thank you. Just a couple things on the thing. So how, ex how and when exactly did the White House encourage her to testify? Well, the, the letter that her attorney sent literally says that if we do not receive a response by March 27th at 10 a.m., I will conclude that the White House does not assert executive privilege over the matters with respect to hearings or otherwise. I don't think you can be any clearer than that. And so you're saying now executive privilege does not... No, no, I'm not saying her. anything. I'm literally, that's what she wrote. The action was, if you don't act, then we will assume the following. Great. I don't think that you can read that any other way. It was very, she's, I'm sure, a very talented, uh, he is a very talented lawyer and wrote it specifically for it. We read it that way and, and chose to not act because we have no problem with her testifying, plain and simple. So executive privilege is not an issue for Sally Yates, would, would have not have been an issue for Sally Yates testifying. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And following I, up, one issue, you wanna add? No, I just, uh, you're, I don't, it's interesting. I mean, th this is very clearly worded and yet somehow you're asking me how to interpret that and in any other way than literally reading plain English. Interpret something else for me. Does the president still believe that climate change is a hoax? I think you'll hear more today about the climate and what he believes. I think he understands. Um, he, he does not believe that, as I mentioned at the outset, that you that is there is a binary choice between job creation, economic growth, and, and caring about the environment. And that's what we should be focusing on. I think at the end of the day, where we should be focusing on is making sure that all Americans have clean water, clean air, and that we do what we can to preserve and protect our environment. Hey, is it April? Or? Is it April? April, go ahead. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, Sean, don't seem so happy. Um, <laughs> you like, go ahead. Anyway, um, with all of these investigations, questions of what is, is, how does this administration try to revamp its image? Two and a half months in, you've got the Yates story today, you've got other things going on, you've got Russia, you've got you got wiretap and you got No, we don't have that. You you you, you I know. On Capitol Hill. No, no, I, I get it, but you keep I I've said it from the day that I got here until whatever that, that there is no connection. You've got Russia. If the president puts Russian salad dressing on his salad tonight, somehow that's a Russian connection. But every single person no, I, and you, and, well, no, that's, I appreciate your agenda here, but the reality is, oh, no, no, hold on. No, at some point, report the facts. The facts are that every single person who has been briefed on this subject has come away with the same conclusion. Republican, Democrat, so I'm sorry that that disgusts you. You're shaking your head. I appreciate it, but, but, I, okay, but understand this, that at some point, the facts are what they are. And every single person who has been briefed on this situation with respect to the, the situation with Russia, Republican, Democrat, Obama appointee, career, have all come to the same conclusion. At some point, April, you're gonna have to take no for an answer with respect to whether or not there was collusion. How do you change the perception be, of, of- We're we gonna keep doing everything we're doing to make sure that the president's, that what the president told the American people he was gonna do to fulfill those pledges and promises that he made, to bring back jobs, to grow the economy, 
to keep our nation safe. That's what he's been focused on since day one. We're going to keep focusing on that every and single Connie day. Rice comes Friday. Condi Rice did not support this president. Um, she did not go to the convention. She comes. What is on the agenda? And and how is their relationship? Has it healed since 2006 when he used a very negative word to so describe? It, here's what I'll tell you. It's interesting that you ask those two questions back to back. On the one hand, you're saying, what are we doing to improve our image? And then here he is once again meeting somebody uh, that hasn't been a big supporter of his. Hold on. I, I, negative I, I, no, no, but, but April, hold on. You, 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 it seems like you're hell-bent on trying to make sure that whatever image you want to tell about this White House stays. Because at the end of the day, the let me answer. I am, I am okay, just but you know what? You're asking me a question, and I'm going to answer it, which is the president. I'm sorry. Please stop shaking your head again. But at some point, the reality is that this president continues to reach out to individuals who have supported him, who didn't support him, Republicans, Democrats, to try to bring the country together and move forward on an agenda that's going to help every American. That's it, plain and simple. So if you're asking what we're doing, I think we continue to do it, which is to bring groups together that have been supportive of them, that haven't been supportive of them, but that to share a goal which is finding common ground on areas of national security, of personal security, of economic security, of job creation, of safer communities, of education, of health care, that can unite us as a country and make the country stronger. What is it about Russia and Tillerson Friday? I, I, I think they're, I'm not ready to, to when, they, when we're done with that, we'll see if we can have a readout. I, 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 I understand that. We're not at Friday yet. I will have a readout when that's done. I know the pool needs to get to the uh, the vans for the for the signing. Thank you. I'll be back tomorrow. We're going to do five days in a row this week, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Mike, I'm plugged in. I forgot to plug in my microphone. Mike, I assume they can hear me now. So anyways, now we're back for real. My fault, everyone. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are back after the Sean Spicer press briefing. Uh, it was a bit of a short briefing because... Uh, because there is going to be President Trump signing this executive order uh, today at uh, supposed to be 2 p.m. Eastern, the energy executive order. So I believe what has to happen is like the press has to like get out of there and go cover that. Or there's some sort of logistics thing that has to happen, but that's why the briefing was so short. But it was pretty fascinating if you were watching the briefing. Uh, the last five minutes was this exchange with April Ryan uh, and... Um, she was asking this question, she asked this question, which was something like, what is the, uh, what do you plan on doing to like improve the president's image? And, and, and then Sean Spicer gave a little resistance to that about that there was this need to improve the image. And she was like, well, you have, you know, you have Russia and you have this and that. And, 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 and Sean Spicer's response, response was like, well, no, we don't have like Russia. You have Russia. That's something that the media complains about. But, and the media tries to make it a big story. But as Sean Spicer said, this is what Sean Spicer said, is if you look at everybody who's looked into this, they don't find any evidence that there was any collusion. Uh, so... You know, it's we don't have this issue. It's the media keeps bringing up this issue. And it, uh, one 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 quote that John Spicer said was, um, "If the president puts Russian salad dressing on his salad tonight, that's a Russian connection." So that was a kind of a neat exchange, I thought. And uh, something else, he was kind of on fire today, Sean Spicer, about a couple things. There was, uh, I'm sorry, Micah. Donations. Oh uh, yes, so. Um, so, and I also want to say, uh, if you've enjoyed the coverage of this so far and you like us coming on and covering these live events, and also covering events like President Trump's uh, rallies and CPAC, we cover all President Trump's rallies. We go and interview the people in line there, and it's, uh, we do that, like, mainstream media doesn't do it, but we do it. Uh, if you like that kind of coverage, we rely on you to stay on the air. Your support keeps us on the air. So if you feel like you want to, we would so appreciate even a small donation, but any donation much appreciated because it helps us 
stay on the air, to donate if you like to donate to Right Side Broadcasting and support us in our in doing this coverage for you. Uh, you can just click on the, in the chat room. There's a chat room next to the next to the broadcast right now. Click on the dollar sign at the bottom of the chat room. If you click on that dollar sign, uh, you can makes it very easy for you to make a donation. Or you can go to rsbn.tv slash donate, rsbn.tv slash donate. But uh, really appreciate it. I know Joanne Goldsnyder uh, made a donation earlier today. Really, thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you to the moderators for moderating the chat. But we really do rely on you to stay on the air. So if you enjoy our programming, even if it's a small donation, much appreciated. They all add up. So thank you in advance. We, uh, we thank you for letting us cover the news for you and bringing you an alternative to the mainstream media. So... Another, so we're waiting right now just for President Trump to sign this executive order on energy. It's supposed to be covering up, coming up in about 23 minutes. So we will uh, cover that for you when it happens. And uh, a couple other things that came out. What was that? There was another thing I wanted to talk about today that Sean Spicer was on fire about. Uh, oh, yeah. So he was talking about how uh, there, there were some questions that came up about Again, once again, Devin Nunes, he went to the White House, he got this information about some surveillance information uh, about President Trump and his associates, and there's these questions about, you know, who did he get it from at the White House, and blah, 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 and what Sean Spicer went on a bit, he... Oh, so what we're going to do right now, just so you know, see, uh, hopefully this makes sense. We are going to go to a separate stream now. So I'm going to stay here, but this stream is going to end because this was like our Sean Spicer press briefing stream. And we're going to open up a new stream. We're going to go to a new stream, which is already up, which is the President Trump signs the executive order stream. So Micah, is that going to be, are we going to tweet out this stream? Is that what we're going to do in Facebook out this stream? So we will, we will post it on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, it's uh, at uh, our, our Twitter is at RSB Network, at RSB Network. It will be tweeted there in a second. So you can just go to that stream and you can watch the remainder of this coverage right here. And then we're going to go to uh, President Trump's signing the executive order. So, Micah, are we going there now? All right, so we're going to go now. So please click on over to the other stream. And again, to find that stream, if you can't find it, just uh, go to our Twitter, at RSB Network. Uh, and maybe the moderators will post it when they get it too. Uh, that'd be awesome of you moderators. Thank you. And uh, so I will see you in a second when, at, at the other stream, hopefully. Come join us at the other stream. See you in, in a minute.